Hello, good afternoon. I'm going to introduce you Patrick Bellew. Patrick is an environmental engineer and a founding director of Atelier 10, a building environmental engineering consultancy with 100 offices worldwide, focusing on delivering high performance buildings. With extensive experience in the integration of environmental and building systems with architecture, Patrick has particular expertise in thermal mass, energy storage technologies, environmental building design and high efficiency building conditioning systems. He also won a series of medals and awards, which I'm not going to list because I would spend a lot of time. <laughs> and um, apparently it's the second time he's coming here to the AA to give a lecture. And I think he has a, a funny or a interesting story to, to tell you. Please welcome me, Patrick, with me. Hi everybody, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I was last here um, just about 19, 20 years ago, I gave a lecture here. Um, and uh, there was a, um, somebody in the room from Yale University who then I got a phone call three days later from the Dean at Yale Architecture School saying he wanted me to go teach at Yale. And you can see up there, I'm now the Aero Saran and visiting professor at Yale. Since then, we've done 40 projects on the Yale campus and I've been working, we now have three offices in America. Vulcan down there has been working with me in New York for a few years. And um, the whole, I've had literally 17 years of my life have been spent, to, you know, like beating, you know, conquering America, a bit like the Beatles did. You won't remember the Beatles, but the Beatles conquered America and they were famous for that. Many, many rock and roll bands failed. Um, we've, we've kind of got there. We're, we're working right across the States now. Um, and um, it all came from a lecture I gave here, which I have to say was rather better attended than this one. So clearly my fame has waned in the 20 years since. So we're, as we, so we're now have 11 offices around the world. Um, and a, a couple of hundred staff. And we focus throughout um, the, the life of the practice on delivering sustainable built environment. I didn't really start out that way. I started out uh, at um, a firm called Bureau Happold, uh, working, uh, my, this guy Ted Happold was my professor at Bath. Um, and he was working with the likes of Ian Liddell and um, Fry Otto. Um, we, we left, um, uh, so I, I, I went to Bath University to study environmental design and um, architecture um, under Ted. He was the professor. He'd left uh, Arup from just around the corner where he'd been working on the Pompidou Center and the Sydney Opera House. And when I went to the open day at Bath, he talked all about that, his experiences working on those projects. I was going to go to Cambridge and read urbanism um, and decided I'd go and do environmental design at Bath instead. And so I ended up there where I bumped into this character, who's a guy called Neil Thomas, who got his MBE last year. He's a founding director of Atelier One. They're our sister company. They do kind of crazy structures. They do a lot of rock and roll. They do Rachel White Reed's art installations and Anish Kapoor's installations, but opening ceremonies for big events. And it was Neil who persuaded me, we were working together, trying to find a way to make structure and environmental engineering and building systems tick as a kind of a, a way of, a, of collaboration. And the big deal that, um, that we, we built together was a kind of our, our vision for Atelier 1 and Atelier 10 was to shape a more sustainable world. Now, this was 27 years ago. This was in 1990. So sustainability almost didn't exist as a word. And in fact, a lot of the stuff we were doing goes back to working with people like Fry and Ian, who designed the Millennium Dome, where it's all about you know, the minimalism in materials and, and minimize, minim, minimizing the amounts of materials you use in buildings. Because when we started out, um, the main thing with M&E engineers was you just made it big enough so you didn't get sued. There were rules of thumb that you know, architecture and engineering didn't speak. The architect gave the drawings to the M&E engineer and he put stuff in it to make it hotter or colder. There was very little dialogue between architecture and engineering in those days. So we kind of began a dialogue and it's only more recently that the, um, the thing has moved the world has moved to a, a, a much bigger concern about the planet. Back in that period, in the 90s, we were still sort of going on the uh, Only One Earth, the Jane Jacobs stuff on cities, and the, 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 all about resource use and minimizing resource use. And I think since then, we've moved into a much bigger concern about global uh, climate change and global warming, which has meant that sort of recognizing that buildings you know, generate 40% of the CO2 used on Earth, generated on Earth. I'm sure it's all stuff you've heard trotted out before. But that's why we have to build better buildings, because the buildings that we use otherwise are, um, you know, are, are causing the problems that the planet is now experiencing and is going to carry on experiencing. 
But back there, slightly, we were back in. This is back in the 90s. We were also very influenced by a kind of a, a, a world where we wanted to do more with less. The Bucky Fuller world, where actually it seemed to me as an engineer starting out, mainly working with structural engineers. Structural engineers always tried to make things smaller and the right size. They very rarely tried to make things bigger. And there was that kind of Bucky Fullerisms around that said, you know, and he was also the first person as kind of the godfather of sustainability almost. I don't know if you've read any of his work, but he was talking about environmental, the environmental world and environmental and, and minimizing the use of materials back in the 60s and 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s. And, and was an extraordinary teacher and philosopher about these things. Now, most of what he wrote is pretty hard to understand. But actually, the basic, the fundamental thesis of what he was trying to do was all about really what we're trying to do these days, which is about being more sustainable. And of course, coming out of a 20th century, and your heritage or our heritage is, as architects, um, all happens that the, 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 the invention, if you like, of both the structure, some, something like the structural engineer, but certainly the M&E engineer or the environmental engineer, happened as technologies evolved in the, 19, uh, the late 19th, early 20th century to allow, to, to liberate architects from the need to build out of masonry and, and, um, and to build buildings that sort of stacked. Now this picture from 1902 shows the Flatiron Building, and what's really interesting about it, if you look closely at all the buildings around this in Madison Square in New York, is that all the buildings have blinds on the outside. And if you go to that building now, the blinds have all been replaced, I have the wrong slide, um, if you, the blinds have all been replaced with air conditioning units. So they have, no, they have no blinds on the outside, but back when the building was built, it was a simple, naturally ventilated building that relied on a bit of thermal mass. So in 1913, Willis Carrier invented vapor compression refrigeration, and we basically liberated architecture to become, uh, uh, to use energy in the way that it does now. And it didn't, you know, the architects of that period didn't need to do that. The Chrysler building was originally uh, naturally ventilated, and the, the natural, naturally ventilated floor plans, but also had air conditioning because it was in the 30s. Now these buildings were sort of intuitively quite environmental, but then along came people like Mies, who you know, took architecture and said it doesn't matter. The international style said it doesn't matter which way it faces, you make all the facades the same and you don't really worry about it. Now, I'm actually a bit unkind to me in this because we worked on this project, the renovate restoration of this building, and we did find out that he actually had the landscape architects plant lots of trees on the outside, on the south, southwest, and, and west side, um, and the so southeast, southwest, and, and, and west side which shaded the building and actually it was actually quite comfortable. It was only when the, land, the trees got chopped down that the building starts to become uncomfortable and they put air conditioning in. But that's a whole other, whole other story. But these buildings, the whole thing about modernism and the way that um, you know, modern buildings were being developed in those days was to say, don't worry about the orientation, don't worry about it, the engineer will fix it. And so the 20th century was about us as engineers fixing the problems in some senses that the architecture was generating because it didn't really care. There was no need to because the engineer would just say, how big does the air conditioning system need to be? I can make it work. It's fine. So, you know, and, and to be fair to them, they had no, there was no agenda at that time for uh, worry about resource use. They were just they were finding oil all over the world. There was, no, there was no sense that the world was being poisoned. There was none of that going on. So the architecture sort of freewheeled its way through the early part of the 20th century, basically saying, yeah, it doesn't really matter. We just build bad. It doesn't matter. As long as the air conditioning engineers can fix it, it'll be fine. Um, along came brutalism. Um, in um, not all, some of it fictional, some of it real, um, but there's nothing really environmental really about the brutalist movement. There was never any sense. I mean, you know, everyone's favourite building at Yale is the Beinecke Rare Books Library, which you haven't been, you should go, it's brilliant, but it's the biggest gas guzzler you ever saw. The walls are made of one inch thick travertine marble, the light comes through it in a most gorgeous way, it's beautiful inside, but it has rare books in it and has to be air conditioned within an inch of its life and therefore it's a, it's a huge gas hazard, but it is a funny, it's a phenomenal building. So, you know, the, the, but there was no environmental story. Um, these are a couple of buildings that we've worked on, renovating, you know, brutalist stuff. These buildings had nothing to do with environment when we got involved in them, but we found a way, we've re reclad and reglazed the Rudolph building at Yale. Um, we've recently been working at the National Theatre, put in all a, a, a whole new uh, range of systems and, and new um, glazing to try and improve the performance there and to make it work a lot better. And there's a new kind of, the new international style, I would also say, just be careful, neo-futurism. I'm not sure that building buildings all out of glass and putting double skin facades this high necessarily creates the, the green buildings of the future. I think this is a new kind of modernism. It's a kind of faux modernism. It doesn't really do what it says on the tin. It's a bit of a nightmare to operate. Be careful. You know, I think there's, there, are more, there are more thoughtful ways of going about building than just the big, it's a glass shard. We'll fix them. Again, the engineers fixed it, mostly. 
So I'm going to wind back now. So what, what, what buildings in, you know, when I started out, we didn't have computers. We did a lot of stuff by instinct. We had a few computers. We didn't really have a lot of computers for doing analysis. Um, so a lot of stuff was done by instinct. But winding back even further, you can find some beautiful um, in examples of kind of environmental buildings back from history. So um, I don't know if you've ever come across these, these villas. This is the Villas Costozzo. It's in a village in uh, the Venezia, north of Venice. Um, and these villas are um, on a hillside. And they sit above a cave system. And this is represented by this lovely picture from, um, by um, Barbara Kender uh, of uh, Prometheus, who stole the sun from Zeus, casting the sun down onto the front of these buildings. While Zephyrus, who's the god of the southwest wind, puffs breeze into this cave system that runs underneath the buildings. And they, the architects, um, uh, and they included, um, and I've gone blank on the name of the guy who's doing it, but <laughs> you can look him up. The architect basically invent, developed this system called Ventiducts, where they basically tunnel down into the cave system and join the houses to these cool, these, uh, these grills, marble grills on the floor. And all the air comes up through the under, underneath, of the, of, in, through the floors of the house and basically provides passive cooling through the cave system. So as the caves are always much cooler than the, uh, the outside air, they get basically passive air conditioning. And lots of um, the, uh, the cognoscenti of, of, the, um, that, of the Venetian architectural scene used to go and hang out in these villas, particularly the Villa Costozza, where the, uh, they would basically enjoy free air conditioning through the summer in the hot, the hot, the hot part of the summer in Italy. So these beautiful, um, simple environmental strategies that were built around a kind of natural form. And back in the early days, we used to always talk a lot about the termites. My, my professor at university was mad for termites. So termites build completely environmentally. They, they basically build their nests and the whole intention is to keep the queen who is at the center of a nest at 30 to 31 degrees centigrade exactly. And they do that by blocking and unblocking these holes in the structure with mud in response to temperature stimuli. Um, and they use the thermal mass of the ground underneath and these earth tubes, these, these tunnels that go out where the workers go out into the, uh, the landscape as the air intake ducts. So the air intakes come in through here into this subterranean chamber. Moisture from the nest drips down these, these radial fins. And this is big enough for David Attenborough and a film crew to get into this chamber because it's been on life on Earth, this particular environmental system. So these are huge underground chambers built by these tiny blind creatures without an architectural degree, amazingly, um, between them. And they, they build instinctively these huge, these huge systems. And, that, and basically what happens is the, the moisture runs down, it evaporates, gives evaporative cooling. The thermal mass of this chamber keeps the space comfortable, keeps the, the center of the nest comfortable. And then when it gets really hot, the workers who would normally be out chewing buildings and, and bits of wood have been observed uh, coming back. Uh, they take a, a, a leaf stem or a seed pod and they'll travel um, maybe 20, 30 meters down to the water table, bring water back up and then tip it into the chamber to give evaporation and evaporative cooling. Um, so if you're interested in a reference for that, there's a book called The Soul of the White Ant. Um, but there's a, 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 a South American, South African anthropologist called Eugene Murray who studied these nests. He did all kinds of crazy things like he would put a metal plate diagonally, whoops, he put a metal plate diagonally through the nest and then he would kill all the, the uh, kill the queen on one side of a nest, and all the other million workers on the other side of the metal plate would stop dead and die immediately. So there was some kind of weird um, system, uh, communication system going on that's probably better than most control systems in our buildings. But it's it's a pheromone communication system that they use. So they're working as a single eco, working as a single ecosystem. It's kind of fascinating because they're producing an, a brilliant environmental control system in a way that's kind of quite, quite humbling to us as designers. So the next bit of a talk is how have we tried to emulate termites and uh, these um, it, uh, crazy Italians in, in building some of the buildings that we've done over the years. And it sort of started at a project we were doing. Um, I worked for Greenpeace for a guy called Jonathan Smales with Peter Clegg of Field and Clegg Bradley. And Peter Clegg's a brilliant environmental designer. And we were, in, the guy left Greenpeace and he started to build, to promote a millennium project called the Earth Center. So this is the Earth Center. It's on the site of an old colliery uh, in Yorkshire. Uh, and so it's a coal spoil heap and it's, it's um, built over two fault lines. So 
Um, it was a very difficult site to, to recover, but it fits, ticked all the boxes for social, environmental, and eco economic sustainability in as much as the idea was to regenerate an old coal town and turn it into a center for, national center for sustainability. So the first project we did on the site was this thing called the Planet, uh, called the, was it called the Planet Earth Gallery? I don't think it was. It was called, it was, I think it, maybe it was. But it was this, this gallery here, which was all about, it was about planet Earth. That was the whole point. A 65,000 square foot, 6,500 square meter gallery space. Um, here you see the first major PV array that was built in the UK about, about 15 years ago, 17 years ago. For two, it was for the millennium. But we were, basically the challenge was to build this, um, this gallery space. And Peter Clegg started sending me some ideas about how we might um, deal with it. And structural engineers were saying it's, it needs to be a very, very thick floor because we can't put piles down because of the faults and it's cold, spoil heap, so it's very, very bad ground. So we need to build a giant raft to sit it on. And I, I sent this um, fax to this sketch in 96 to, to Peter saying, well, could we sort of turn it into two slabs and put up some walls in between and make a kind of labyrinth of tunnels that we could, like the termites, send the air down the labyrinth at night to cool it down and then let the air come out into the space in the daytime and condition the space. No computer power. This was all done in the back of a fag packet. Uh, I smoked back then, so we did use fag packets for design. Um, and we, this was how we, this was the first sketches. It turned into something like this, and we built, this is what we built. Uh, air handling units back here, pushing air into these tunnels and the air coming out through these these linear grills here and out through the floor into the gallery space above. Completely eliminated any air conditioning, reduced the cooling demand, heating demands by about 50% because we could stabilize the temperature um, and store energy from day to night, which is the big thing with our systems, trying to equalize the weather from the hot days, cold nights, uh, and vice versa in the winter. So this was the first example of the, of the, of the labyrinth. And what was kind of weird was when we, we got to this point we had these sketches and this design but it was a lottery project so we had, nobody had any money to do it because you didn't get the money until you got the money and so but you had to pitch to the idea before you got the money so we were waiting for about two three years while the lottery made up their minds what they were going to do in about 1998 um, or maybe 1997 and then we waited two and a half years and then they finally said you got the money you have to get it built in 18 months and we hadn't done any analysis or anything on it and the first thing of course we had to build was the foundations because it was appointed a contractor and that they had to basically build the foundation so we had a meeting where we looked around and said will it work and we went yeah i think so um <laughs> and we built it and we went on we were still analyzing it and doing analysis on it when we built when we were building it and making it work which is kind of crazy when you look back on it but that was the way that our our system procured buildings for that particular a big event the the millennium 2000 most of you probably weren't born there you would have been born there but not by, not by, not for long so that, that was the first of the, the sort of labyrinthy buildings. And we took the idea down to a project in Melbourne. Um, it's been in the press lately because, um, I don't know if you've seen it, but the, uh, they're going to knock this building down and put a new Apple store there. And the people have been marching on the city of Melbourne have been, I mean, they're so upset about it because Apple, uh, commercialism's taking over from art, which is not great. But this was a project we designed with um, some guys who taught here for a long time, Peter Davidson and Don Bates, who are great friends of the AA. Uh, they were living in a garret in Good Street, literally with a hole in the floor, and we used to go and do the design. We're doing the design for this competition. This is an international design competition. I used to take a bottle of Jameson's on a Friday night to keep them going through the weekend, you know, because it was that it was that hard. We were they were working for months just on fresh air. They had nothing. Um, and we did this design. They got down to the last three, and then they had to produce all these models, and we helped them to sort of fund all that to, to set this thing going. So it's an art gallery. It's a, an atrium space. This is the uh, Sydney Broad uh, SBS. It's the broad a local broadcasting centre. Um, the famous shards, and then uh, a digital display screen where they show the uh, Australians walloping us at cricket um, up to 20,000 people who can sit in the square. And we built it over the train tracks that were running into Melbourne Station. And we wanted a the big environmental idea was how to condition this open-ended atrium space that ran through the centre. It was going to get very hot because it had a lot of western glass. And it was all about being open to the square. So we said, well, there's a big space between the train track crash deck and the, this piazza which was sloping up. Can we put a labyrinth in there? Um, and so we came up with this idea for these uh, concrete tunnels and concrete passageways that run backwards and forwards. So the air comes in over here and it passes backwards and forwards. It runs about 150 meters past 
four meter high concrete walls. And these concrete walls are rippled to maximize surface area and, and the, the kind of the, the contact. So, and I went down there and they were trying to knock 200 million off the budget because we were so, it was so over budget, the project. So I flew down to Australia with my little roll of drawings, no, no PowerPoints in those days. It was a roll of drawings over my shoulder. And sort of, I heard the, I could hear the bloodletting going on as they were trying to you know, kill the architect in the room, trying to take 200 million out of the budget. And I unfurled my drawings and put them on the wall with a usual anthill drawing and all that sort of thing. Thinking, I'm going to die here, I'm thinking. This is not going to go well. But they totally loved it. They got the whole um, thing and they got it as the kind of, if you go to the Federation Square website, even today, they have a, it has its own, the labyrinth has its own tab uh, on the website. So this is very much part of the, the sort of thing. But this whole center runs, um, I haven't got a good picture of it, but inside the atrium here runs at, um, uh, about 25 or 26 degrees centigrade when it's 40 outside without any mechanical cooling. And I, just, I just want to pause on that just to make a point because one of the big things you have to sell to clients sometimes talk about sustainability. They always say, oh, can we afford it? It costs more. What are we going to do? With certain types of clients, you can run an argument about intergenerational thinking. You can say to them, this is for 100 years. This building is here for 100 years. It's an art center, community center. In that 100 years, you would change the refrigeration system, the air handling units, the fans, if it, you know, five times. Every 20 years, you have to replace the plant and all the kit. Here, there's no kit to replace. It's just some blowers and there's some filters, and that's it. And so not only are you investing for today's generation, you're, in, you're, you're investing intergenerationally in an idea about uh, hope for the future. And at that time, the weather was starting to get hotter in Australia and they were getting worried about it. And the great thing about this is the hotter it gets, the kind of the better it works. And they absolutely bought it and they went, they went for it. And it's a very, very important philosophical point that I almost forgot to mention. You know, it's, that is how you, people often, how do you get these things to work, to, to sell them to clients in buildings? You sell it to them by not, necessarily doing the payback, you know, the payback period and all that kind of stuff. You sell it to their souls about, about environmental design, about the future and securing a, a mutual future. It sometimes works. Sometimes you get your ass kicked out of the room. What can I say? You know, it doesn't always work, but that's the way in, the, in a way that you have to play these things uh, in, or not, play, that sounds wrong. I don't mean play it. It's the way you have to explain these things to people to make them realize this is serious. You know, it's not a, it's not a game. Other clients, this one was the, the, the new Alpine house at Kew Gardens. As you ever go down to Kew, you'll see this tiny little glass house, a hundred square meter glass house with Wilkinson Air. And normally an alpine house would have a, a refrigeration unit outside to keep the alpine plants cool. Um, but we have a little labyrinth underneath. Um, and again, no kits. It's a very, very simple, just a small power cable to the building to run the fans and a control system that basically cools the labyrinth at night and blows the cool air over the plants in the daytime. Really, really simple, but very effective. And a labyrinth is literally just some concrete blocks laid, laid end to end. And not to give you the impression I'm a one-trick pony, uh, this is another one in, uh, in, in uh, Ankara in Turkey. Uh, this is a guy I studied with at Bath, was the architect uh, Selçuk Avci. Um, I think he's taught here as well, actually, Selçuk, for a while. Um, and he, uh, he, he's moved to, Tur to Istanbul now, and he, he works out of there. But um, he asked us to help with the competition for this headquarters building for the Turkish Contractors Association. Not the Turkish M&E Contractors Association, Turkish Contractors Association. So the big sale here was to say, you guys build, but actually what happens in most of Turkey is the air conditioning just kind of takes over. So Ankara is right up here in the, um, uh, on the um, Asian side of Turkey. There's Istanbul's over here. Um, and uh, Atatürk moved the, moved the capital here, I think, because the weather was much uh, was not so humid in the summer. So it's very big diurnal swings in temperature. So often when you're looking for these types of systems, you've got to look at the weather data. If it's Singapore and the weather is always like that, there's no point in trying to put in a thermal mass storage system because you need to have the day to night temperatures being um, swinging like this because it's temperature over time is energy. So that means in this space, you've got cooling energy required. In this space, you can store energy. Here you've got so and so on and so on. So the idea is you can store cool at night that you can discharge during the day to help to flatten out those peaks. And have a normal approach in Turkey is honestly, it's this bad. They, everything just gets split system air conditioners thrown at it. And all of those are designed for the hottest day and they work inefficiently for the rest of the year because they're short cycling because on a hot day, you're designed for the max, but for the rest of the time, you're running inefficiently. So that, the whole point of this is to try and attenuate the, these, these gains. 
that wasn't just about the labyrinth. We did a lot of work with the architects to look at shading the facades, to make sure we got great daylight in, to allow natural cross ventilation for six, seven months of the year. So this is a mixed mode building. We have little and yellow and green indicator lights. Now we have little red and green indicator lights on all the windows. And when it's a natural vent day, the, the windows have a little red light over them and they're told not to open them. And on a natural vent day, they've got a green light and you open the windows and people open the windows and they can let the building breathe without it impacting on the services. Uh, lots of um, solar control on the facade. I'm going to zip on because I've got quite a lot to go through. And then uh, down in the basement, we persuaded them to dig, a, dig, an, extra dig an extra level to put a labyrinth in. Um, and it was when we really explained to them that this was about getting rid of the M&E plant and about in building with concrete and cement, which is what they do as Turkish contractors, they kind of got it and said, yeah, we want to do this, we want to build it. Um, and so uh, we built the design, these labyrinths, so they're relatively short by comparison with the ones in Melbourne, but the air runs critically around 60 metres along concrete passageways at about a speed of one to two metres per second, so very slow, but it's just picking up, moving heat around as it's going. And the, the walls, we made of um, landscaping blocks. They're just literally dense concrete blocks with these ripples on. And again, we wanted the ripples to stop or the, the, the surface roughness to give you um, uh, a little roughness to improve the heat transfer. So this was me down approving the block. I had to go out and look at the block before they started, before this poor devil started building them down in the basement. So that he, rather than in Melbourne, we built it, um, we cast it all in situ and tipped up, tipped up formwork here. Some poor guy spent a lot of time down there putting, stacking bricks on top of each other. Um, but uh, they ended up making it tall enough to put door sets in. These have got the louvers in that do the controls. But I, and I've taken guided tours of kind of the Turkish Architects Association. It took 120 architects around one night. Um, well, I think we took 120 down and about 90 came back out again, but uh, they're probably still wandering around <laughs> trying to find their way out. But it is, a, it is a bit of a labyrinth. So that's what we call them, labyrinths. But they, um, they've become very much the, the thing that we do in buildings. We also, in this building, um, we put uh, concrete, uh, sorry, steel ducts into the concrete slabs so that we can also cool the concrete down at night um, because the, it's so cool every night in, in, in Ankara. It's a perfect weather to provide free cooling. So we cool the concrete mass down at night. These guys are putting ductwork in for the concrete goes down and you can see it here. They left a cutaway slab to illustrate the technology. And then we put a little chill beam underneath with lighting, exposed concrete. And then these, these buildings pretty much freewheel. Uh, they're naturally ventilating or the thermal mass system works for 90% of the time. And then just on really hot days, the chill beam gives them a little bit of extra capacity. So it's a, it's a kind of totally uh, integrated building and it uses um, a, a fraction of the energy that a typical Turkish office building would do. And instead of all those air conditioners, we have these on the roof and a very, very small blast cooler just for the hottest weather, um, for, for getting rid of heat. Um, and it pretty much runs on, on stored energy. So it's a, I think it's a, a, a bit of a Bucky Fuller quote coming up, which um, he said that you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes existing model obsolete. And that's what we were kind of persuading his client, that the way they built in Turkey should, is obsolete and they should fix it, they should, they should do it better. I'm, I wouldn't say we've quite fixed it yet, um, but we're st they, there are now a few buildings that are starting to come online that have got, have got this kind of thermal mass storage and are using the weather, and that's what we're talking about. And it was the first LEED Platinum building in Ankara. So that's sort of taking that one idea about the ant hills or the other the idea about the, the, the Venetian villas um, and finding how we could reinterpret that into a modern piece of building and construction and architecture. And they honestly are rooted in that. You know, a lot of this stuff, we, we analyze it now um, and we spend a lot of time doing analysis on these things, but often we, we slightly prove it's, it, we, it's, it's kind of harder to prove that it works than knowing that it works when we built it because the computer quite often will say no. Um, and that's, that's very frustrating, um, isn't it, Vulcan? Yes. <laughs> we, uh, a lot of things that we've built and we've had work, when you run it through the computer simulation programs, it kind of goes, yeah, not so great. And you go, no, we know it works. We've done it. It's, it's, it's instinctive. It feels like it works. So I, do, I still feel that there's a big part of what we do uh, as designers has to still be instinctive. And we're not trying to take away that, necessarily completely take away that instinctive thing. Um, for another project that we did with uh, Hopkins at the, the World Wildlife Fund, not the World Wrestling Foundation um, Federation, the Living Planet Centre in Wokey in Surrey, which you can go visit if you're interested. It's just down the, down the rail line from Waterloo. Um, this is a Briam outstanding building, uh, office building for this, for this um, uh, NGO. 
Um, and the design process, this was the, the site, um, and we're going to build it above the car park, so it's an air rights building over the car park um, in a pretty sort of not great area of this little town called Woking. But we, we, I'm not going to go, I'm going to not dwell on this too much, but we went through a huge amount of exercise, a huge exercise to manage solar gains, to make sure that the shading system was precisely designed to keep the sun where we wanted it, particularly in the, the summertime. Um, we want to keep a lot of the sun off, but we want the light. And in the winter time, you want the sun in, but you want to control it so you don't get glare. So it's all built around all of that. But we're also very much about the process, the, um, the idea of biophilia, bringing light into the space to, to, to keep plants alive. And so um, this is a daylight map of this space. We work with the architects to develop the skylighting and the daylighting system so that we had a daylight factor above four in all of the office spaces, which is generally means that you can work pretty much whenever the, um, it's a day, in daylight hours without any artificial lighting, um, a big part of what the, um, the WWF wanted. But also the, the environmental system uh, was based again on what we call mixed mode operations. So the building works is naturally ventilated in the spring and summer, um, though in the spring and autumn, um, which is basically that the windows at the edge open again, little red and green lights telling you when, to, when you can open them. So just here you can just see a little red and green light. Uh, in the window frame. Being Hopkins, it's quite minimal. Um, and then the, the wind breeze comes in through here and goes up and out through the wind cowls at the top, which are very, you know, bit based upon a kind of traditional English kind of design. But when we get to, so that's the, the components of that natural vent system. When we get to the, the mid-season, out of the mid-seasons, we go to a, a mode which uses a similar thing to the kind of labyrinths, but uses a thing called earth tubes, earth ducts. So these are uh, 70, 80 meter long concrete pipes that are buried in the ground beneath the building. Um, they wrap backwards and forwards and we push all of the air that comes into the building, goes through these concrete tubes, again, just like the anthill really, and delivers the air through the floor, through a displacement system into the space. So these are the, the concrete pipes, which are our ventilation system. Um, they pop up in the, just down the edge of the car park here in these little, um, I don't know what you call them, rope, um, like Daleks, for us who knew you know, about Doctor Who. Um, but they, they effectively are 90 centimetre diameter drain pipes that are designed to, be, to resist water coming in, uh, laid to a slight fall, and say they're about 80 metres long. And 80 metres, the air coming in at 28 degrees on a hot day will be in contact with the ground that's at 12 degrees all the way along the pipe, 12 or 13 degrees. By the time it comes out the other end, the air is at about 17 degrees centigrade which is perfectly fine to put it into the floor and bring it out through the floor as a, a sort of passively cooled uh, outdoor air. So it gives us basically full air conditioning in the building through the summer without any refrigeration system at all. Um, and these are things, so this is, a measure, this is some measurements. You won't be able to see this graph, but you can have to take it from me that this says 30 degrees, this line. So that's the outside air temperature spiking at 32 on three consecutive days. And the air in the earth duct, this is about 12 degrees. And it has it a few hot days. It goes up to 15, ooh, sorry, I hit the wrong button. Um, it goes up to 15, 16 degrees centigrade on, a, on, very, on the very hottest days and then cools down again at night because obviously you're able to push the air through it at night time as well. So this gives us the ability to kind of passively air condition buildings. You look at these buildings and say, why don't we do all buildings like this? Huh? Why don't we? It's so easy, it's particularly low rise buildings. It gets high, harder when you're doing city buildings and they're tall and you, can't, you haven't got the footprint to do all this stuff. But I just think you know, every business park in England that has an air conditioning system, or has a, a conventional chiller and cooling system, they just need to look at these buildings. They work, they've all been working for years. You know, it's, it's not complicated. I, I was teaching uh, in Germany, in, in, Aust in the US, sorry, with a German uh, engineer called Thomas Auer from a really brilliant company called Transsolar. And when we first did these earth ducts, we went, I, I phoned him and said, Thomas, you always talk about earth ducts. Have you got some buildings in Stuttgart we can go and look at? I'll take a, bring a client to. He said, oh yeah, I think 60 or 70. So we went round in a day, five office buildings on different parts of Stuttgart, all of which had these big earth pipes, all of which did this as a standard thing. It's absolutely normal in Germany. All the buildings do it. They think we're crazy putting in, you know, Dakin air conditioners and Toyota air conditioners to do all the conditioning. Because, it, you know, you look at, the, look at the physics, it's not that hard. It really isn't that hard. So, why, I mean, it, it, I mean we're, we have offices in Scotland and we still put air conditioning in offices in Scotland because the developers want us to put, they have to have a box saying York air conditioning or something or train or, sorry if I'm on film de denigrating anybody, but, you know, it, it, they, they want a box that says 
that, that they've got air conditioning. But actually, you don't need it. You really don't need to do it in our climate if you do it smart. So I'm not saying we're particularly smart, we're just copying the Germans, let's be honest about this. And a lot of this is you know, technology that's been widely trialed. But we're, in England, we're really slow, our, our market's very slow at picking up on this. And it needs you guys to ask the questions when you're starting to work on your projects as architects and sustainability consultants to say, we know we can do this better. It doesn't have to be exactly like the old way. You can always change. The change is the change is possible, and we've done it. We proved it. We sometimes I don't sleep nights, but mostly I do um, when we do when these projects are getting put together. So we do have a small cooling heating cooling system here. We've got 22 uh, um, ground source boreholes that go about 100 meters down into the ground. <coughs> they have this plastic pipe that oh, I've done it again. Sorry, they have a plastic pipe that we pump water and glycol solution down and basically put that into a water source heat pump to take heat out in the winter and put it back into the ground in the summer. And that gives us a little bit of capacity for, um, for heating, because we, we do still need a little bit of heating. We made the decision to go all electric on this building rather than putting in connections to district heating because we felt that with the um, decarbonisation of the grid, ultimately, I think electrical energy is probably going to be um, well, it's already getting a lot, a lot more um, lower carbon content, but we'll get better and better, I think, as the years go on. Um, and gives us the opportunity also to buy renewable energy, which, green, which um, WWF do, um, to offset their carbon emissions. So this is kind of net zero carbon, they claim, but because they're, they're buying green energy off the grid. How am I doing for time? Oh, rambling on. Um, so also on the roof of the building, we have lots of PV cells um, to do, which only does about 20% does about of the regulated energy load for the building. So um, a decent contribution to what's left in our low energy building. But of course, you know, so many clients come to you and say, I want to do a green building, I want to put PV on the roof. And I hope you can see from that little thing that, that, that the PV is kind of the last thing we do. The first thing you do is you make the architecture better so the building doesn't use so much. Then you make the systems better so that they don't have to use so much. And then it's possible to get 20% of the remaining energy from renewables. If you take a bad building and stick lipstick on it, you get a, which is PV panels, you know, on a bad building, we call it lipstick on a gorilla. It's, it's kind of, you can get three or 4% of the energy. You have to work hard to reduce demand first. And demand reduction is where we always start at Atelier 10 drive demand down, make the systems efficient, and then you do the green, the green stuff on the roof. But that is, it really is, it is the last thing you think about in, in many ways on these projects, although uh, you know, the architects always are, are prioritizing that. We also work with Sturgis Carbon Profiling. This is going to be, this is an increasingly important area of the work that we're doing, um, looking at embodied carbon. Um, with Simon's team, we, <clears throat> we did a whole, what what's, you know, might seem blindingly obvious things about reducing the um, cement content of the concretes that we were using. We were looking at um, low carbon cements. We were making very precise decisions about the window frame system to minimize um, raw aluminium, maximize um, recycled aluminium, so on and so on and so on. Re all the rebar in the steel um, was 100% recycled. So just by making the right decisions between stage three and stage four, we save 4,000 tons of CO2 emissions, which is about two years worth of the building's um, CO2 emissions, just on decision making with the architects and the carbon consultants. So again, body carbon is becoming, you know, clearly as you make buildings get better and better and better, and they use less and less energy, the embodied carbon you use to build them becomes a bigger proportion and a bigger concern for how we do, uh, how we go about building um, in an environmental way. So again, this is kind of, it's slightly dull, but you have to sit there and work through a lot of spreadsheets, but that's how you get, um, you know, how you can save a lot of carbon as well. Um, and this got the outstanding uh, rating for Briam, and it's a much visited building. Weirdly, it won the Innovation Award from um, the um, British Council for Officers, I think two, two years ago we won the Innovation Award. And actually it uses exactly the same systems we put in a building 20 years ago. Uh, we had a building with earth ducts and underfloor air and it's an office building down in Kent. But it didn't catch anyone's attention, but because this was a bit higher profile, um, 20 years on it became the Innovative build, Innovation Building, Innovation Award of the Year, which just always made me kind of laugh. I mean, I'm happy about it, obviously to win it. it got, the building got recognized, but it is slightly strange that it's taken so long for this industry to change. So I'm just going to finish-ish, not quite finished, talking about a project that we were lucky enough to win as another international design competition uh, called the Gardens by the Bay in Singapore. Any of you been? 
Anyone been to gardens, by the way? A few people. A few people, okay. Uh, it was a, a competition. We've been working with Andy Grant since the Earth Centre days, at Grant Associates, and with um, Jim Eyre and Paul Baker at Wilkinson Air for years. Atelier One, obviously, have been involved a long time. And the competition was to design a new garden for this 55 hectare site here. Um, this is the fam now famous Musha Safdi uh, Hotel Triple Three Towers with a surfboard on the roof building right here. Um, there's another garden up here, uh, which is ultimately won by um, Gustafsson Porter, Catherine Gustafsson, and another garden going up here. So basically it was called Gardens by the Bay, and this is the Marina Bay, building a barrage here to turn this from a freshwater area to seawater. Um, sorry, vice versa, from seawater to freshwater. Um, and um, slightly weirdly, this project we did in about 1990s, the Opera House, the Esplanade, which is called the Durian Building, that was on the waterfront when we designed it in Singapore. So Singapore has grown, this is all landfill, um, and it's, it's been an amazing change in, in 27 years. So this was the, uh, we had a week to do an animation for the competition. I think it's kind of cute, so I would put it in. Um, so this was done by Squint Opera, which is uh, um, Will Alsop's son runs Squint Opera, and uh, very early in their life. So from the beginning we were talking about natural cooling and how the buildings might work with natural cooling, how we might work with the environment to make them work. Andrew's big idea was these things called super trees, which is like super nature, a giant sized early established part of the gardens that would be part of the experience. Uh, value engineering slightly reduced the number, for those of you who've been there, you see there's not quite that many there now. And then we were really geared up to try and make them, maybe slightly post-rationalise them, but geared up to make them uh, 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 part of the education, but also part of the environmental systems of the gardens, um, as well as providing shading as we went along. But you see our environmental diagrams just zip past them sitting there. And the first of the two glass houses is the um, dry biome. So this is a Mediterranean biome. Uh, it'd be one of the largest biomes in the world and designed to, as a showcase for Mediterranean plants. So, Air temperature not above 26 degrees, relative humidity not above 60%. Light levels 45,000 uh, lux at peak needed for the plants to flower uh, and about um, 500 um, megalux hours a year to make them give the comfort. The other one is a mountain biome, tropical montane, so also cool, 21, 22 degrees centigrade, like up in the mountains of Cotacimbalu and Mexico. Uh, with humidity up at around 90%, peaking at 100% when we release the fogging system to, to drive out the foggers. And here we're exhibiting plants and palms. So two giant glass houses. At the competition stage, it's watches that fades, we thought we could design them with glass and then with the big fins that would be the structure as our shading system, because it's on the equator, we were kind of worried about the sun for obvious reasons being too strong. And I'm going to come back to that in a bit. Um, and we, we also... Because of the big towers that are sitting here, we knew that there was shadow being cast upon a lot of the garden by much, for much of the day by Moshe Safdie's big, be careful what I say, a big, large structures um, with the surfboard on the roof. We're going to put shadows here. So we, put, we needed light in the biomes above everything else. Plants need light. It's very different to humans. Um, and so we put the, the glass houses up at the top of the site, and then they're linked together by these pathways that, and, and secondary gardens that are built around the, the patterns of a, an orchid flower flowering on the knuckle. This is then built. I'm jumping to the, the, the finished story. Um, so this is the, the, the Mediterranean glass house. This is the, the mountain, tropical montane glass house. The entrance areas are here, open air. And then there's a giant sort of restaurant complex under here, energy center here. And here's the super tree, three super tree groves. These two are linked to the energy system. Um, and these are a little bit, but mainly they're restaurants, bars, and, and a, a giant aerial walkway they have a light, where they have a light show every night. Um, these super trees disperse the heat from inside here, and I'll, I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, we also had a, um, a main water course from a city running through here, um, which we have to filter all the dust and dirt out of, so that's all part of a, a big water story. So I mentioned the sort of environmental design criteria. Completely different. Oh, the other thing the client said, we needed to use less energy than an office building in Singapore. We went, Okay, it's kind of big for that, but that's, that, was the, that was the challenge. Um, but if you see, this is the pink is where the plants come from, uh, the Mediterranean plants, and then the green is the, the tropical montane plants. But the key things were these light levels. I mean, you think you, I don't know if you're familiar with designing office spaces, but you'd normally design an office to be at around about 500 to 1,000 lux uh, at peak um, in, a, in a working environment, maybe 300 lux for, for artificial light. And so 45,000 lux are required at peak times. 
Um, and then we also, for the air temperatures, we had to be able to generate um, different air temperatures inside. So daytime is at 25. At night time, because we have to fool the plants as a day-night cycle if they're going to flourish in there, it's down to 17 degrees. And then for one month every four, we have to hit it with a 13 degree centigrade at night. So they think they're going to vernalize, going, going to go into winter mode. So the plants will actually flower because the trees are going to be there for a long time. Um, and we also have to blow uh, air at them really fast at night. So we have these giant fans they come and plug in at night um, because the trees don't develop roots unless you um, give them something to agitate against. And the root system then holds, stops them from falling over. So a lot of um, work was done on the kind of environmental system Systems, and it was a unique challenge, really. Um, so there's just an example. That's the 45,000 lux compared to what you'd need in an office or in a house. So they needed a huge amount of light. This is what we, we, we realized as we were developing it. Um, and the other problem with Singapore is it's incredibly cloudy. So on 62% of days, you will have cloud at 2 in the afternoon. It's usually clear in the mornings. Um, but it gets cloudier through the day. In the afternoon, it's generally cloudier, cloudy, and then it, uh, it starts to clear often towards the evening when there's no sunlight anyway. So actually, if you think about it, and it's also worth, because we're on the equator, we only get a 12-hour day. Now, we're going to put in this glasshouse olive trees that will be sitting on a hillside outside Rome or somewhere or down in the Greek, Greek islands, which would get 18 hours of sunlight, full on blue sky sunlight in, in, in Greece. And they're only going to get 12 hours and it's going to be cloudy half the time. So it was a, we, we realized as we got into it that light was a massive problem. And we had to make these structures as light as possible to let the light in and then only control peak sunlight. We went into a massive amount of detail with the uh, horticulturalists. So this is work we did with the botanists um, and with Transola, who were also helping on this. Um, and we're looking at, this is, I can't, probably can't remember, this is hydrangeas, dahlias, asters, ranunculus, euphorbia, freesias, they're types of flowers, plants. And this is the amount of light they need. Sorry, this machine keeps uh, jumping, beg your pardon. This is the amount of light that they need uh, per, uh, annually, global luminance levels, and uh, needs to be, sorry, uh, peak daily. We need more than 45,000 lux to make these, some of these plants flower. So that was, the, that was our challenge. So something we could never have done a few years ago, we started to test different structural solutions working with Atelier One uh, for light levels and to identify where we could get the brightest levels so we could put the right species in the right places working with the horticulturalists. Um, and we started with the fin that I mentioned was the original design, which we thought was a shading system, big structure, glass in between, and it absolutely killed the light levels. It just blocked out way too much light. We then looked at making those fins into trusses to let the light through, still kill too much light. So it was only when we got to a, a different solution that Atelier One came up with, which is a grid shell. Um, so it's a glass grid shell that is basically free to move, and then it's just restrained by the arches that go over the top. So these arches don't actually carry the weight of the grid shell, it's self-loading self and the, the arches are very light, so they only just stop the, the grid shell from falling over, is the, the basic principle. Um, we then worked with them to, this was the original detail for the grid shell supporting the glass system, and we got it down to this, because we had the, that was producing so much shade inside that we, were, we had to basically reduce it and reduce it, even to the point where we mitered the, the, grid, the inside of the grid shell, so that as you're looking up, you just don't, the plants looking up, don't see any light going through. These are Neil Thomas's wonderful hand sketches. If you want to see a guy do hand sketching, this is, he's a man. He teaches here sometimes, so go to his classes if you see him. Um, he does these on the train. It's really irritating. He'll sit there and just draw these beautiful 3D drawings right in front of you. Um, anyway, looking up from underneath, you can see that you ha there's trees looking up, hardly see any structure in the way. They see the main, these arches going over, but there's really very little, little occlusion. And yes, you get lateral blockage to the daylight, but the, the light coming straight down from the sky onto these trees is, is enormous, and we get 45,000 lux at peak. Um, so this, was, this is how it ended up, and this is what we built. Um, the only cross bracing in the building are these little wire cross braces here. That's what stops it all from sort of tumbling over. But a very much a, a lighting a, a structure that's tuned to lighting. And I guess the point to labor this is, you know, this is really about integrated design. It's the most integrated project we've ever done, integrating everything with the architecture. Because what you don't see here is air ducts or stuff. It's air, this is fully air conditioned, fully cooled, but it's cooled by the floors having pipes in them, which you've got chill water in. So any sun that comes in and hits the floor gets the heat, instead of the heat re-radiating and promoting the greenhouse effect, we have pipes in the floor which take the heat away. Then we have air built in, coming in through all these sides of these planter beds, so there's cool air spilling out across the floor as well. 
Um, but the trees absorb about 85% of the energy that comes in that hits the trees is, is turned into is the chemical energy. So only about 15% gets re-radiated as heat. So the trees are very much our friends in this battle. But we, we've also got an issue then of not letting, we want light but not heat. So we, we worked with a lot of the glazing manufacturers around the world to find the, the best glass. Um, so we have a selective coating that gives us a visible light transmission of 65%, which we needed for the plants, but only lets the heat in at 35%. Because you get about 1,200 watts a square meter of sun on the equator hitting the, the glass house. So you can imagine if 70% of that comes in at 700 watts for every square meter, it's a huge energy demand. Um, we then work with, with Wilkinson to come up with a shading system. So on the really hottest days, we do need to keep the sun off because it's just too, too it takes more. So if the direct overhead sun, we, sh we shade. We let the side, sun come in from the side. So um, we came up with this idea for these sails structures that are like uh, um, boat sails that deploy out from the main structural beams and shade the glass. So on a day where we've got really intense overhead sunlight, we let the low angle stuff come in from the sides and sometimes we don't deploy these ones, but we just put shading out over the, over the center of the building. Um, and then and they, they hide away like a yacht sail inside. Um, so that the, uh, w when you're inside, you can always stand. We don't always fully deploy them, so you can stand in the shade because you don't get that kind of high radiant heat on you. Um, but the, the, so the, the shade's partly deployed just to take the edge off the, the air conditioning loads to reduce the energy use. Um, so Singapore, I, if, I don't know if you're familiar with the psychometric chart, but temperature and humidity. Um, in, in England, the psychometric chart sort of all comes down here and this is all full of dots. In Singapore, it's just always hot and humid. This is typical tropics. It's always over 20 degrees centigrade and it's always about 80, 90% humid. Um, and so the main problem we had to get to these conditions is we had to dehumidify the air and then we had to basically dry it. So dehumidification, sorry, is like that line of constant moisture content and then we could cool it so we were looking for ways to do that in as energy efficient way as we could we could we integrated airflow into air and these pipes into all of the systems into all of the surfaces of the building to so we could control the um uh, the temperature inside but and we developed with the architects um, different ways of getting the air into the space to try and make it as invisible as possible we then did lots of CFD analysis to show that we were just trying to cool the areas where people were. So these blue zones allowed us to kind of calibrate the amount of air, liters per second per square meter here, going into every part of the building to allow us to uh, analyze how much air had to go in. And then we started to build with these pipes in the ground, and this was the air handling plant room. These are some of the, air, the return air grills here that bring air back down to the, to the ground. And this was in construction. We were also pushing air out at low level in the planter beds to keep the plants themselves cool through these displacement terminals and these grills around here. In the, um, uh, all around the planter beds, we had these measuring stations that measure the um, black bulb temperature, the radiant temperature, the light level, and we also sniff temperature and humidity so we control everything as we go around the garden. And there's a hidden um, air supply diffuser built into the, built into the landscape. In the cloud forest, um, we basically did a similar thing at low level with all the air supply coming in at the low level. This is the amazing mountain. So you kind of come in here, Guggenheim-like, you go and lift up to the top and then you wind your way down all these walkways through this um, incredible, um, incredible garden. And every uh, half hour, we release foggers to basically um, put up to 100% relative humidity. And when you look down, the, what you see here is all the, you see people walking around, but this is all cooling surface and then air supply surface are all these metal grills that run around here. So cool air is pouring in just to develop a pool of cool air at the bottom of the building. So. Back to the question, how do you make a building like this net zero carbon? Well, we had uh, figured out early on that the best way to dry the air, going back to my psychometric chart, was to use a thing called liquid desiccants. Have you ever, you come across desiccants, I guess, in when you buy a, um, leather goods or shoes or wallets or bags, you get a little bag which says silica do not eat. Don't eat it. Um, that's a desiccant. And that a desiccant will basically take the moisture out of the air. And you can regenerate that desiccant by drying it with, with heat, so it'll drive the moisture off so you can use it again. So we figured if you do, you can do this with a liquid, a lithium chloride, so we could basically dry all of the air in the space. And we then thought, how can we use, how can we regenerate that? 
Now, the initial idea was we were going to use solar energy, but at a, at a meeting that I had with the, the, the boss of the gardens, we had a cocktail party one night, he said that he was looking after three million trees in Singapore. I said, what do you mean by you're looking after three million trees? He said, well, I prune every tree in Singapore in the public, public realm every two years. So he's given one and a half million trees a haircut every year. So I said, so what do you do with all the wood waste? And he said, I don't know. I'll go find out. So he f turned out there were all these massive amounts of wood waste that's coming off the trees. So every, wherever you go in Singapore, you see these guys giving these trees a haircut because they grow like crazy. And they basically would put this, they'd take it all away, and they were taking it away to an incinerator plant outside the city and burning it. So he said, well, can we intercept that waste and basically put it into our energy system? At the same time, we also found that the port, which is huge, um, gets rid of massive amounts of timber waste every day with uh, package, dry package goods that come in from China, particularly, where they use a lot of timber packing cases. So we said, well, we could take that, mix it with wood waste, and use that as a fuel for the building. So every night, 18 articulated lorries arrive and dump 500 cubic meters of, of wood waste into a giant structure where it has a walking floor that walks wood into a biomass boiler. The biomass boiler, which has a chimney that goes up inside one of the super trees, uh, heats, uh, st makes steam. We have a steam turbine then that drives uh, uh, chillers, with, but sends power to chillers. And then the heat drives absorption chillers to provide cooling. And then the waste heat from that goes into a desiccant regenerator system that dries out the desiccants and pushes the waste water up the, up the super trees. So effectively, oh, this is a sort of brief diagram. So you've got the desiccant system there that shows that, that, that part of the cycle. Here's the biomass arriving, going into a steam turbine. And we also recycle all the ash, goes out to be used as fertilizer in the garden. And then uh, we have uh, the, cool, the waste heat basically provides cooling through electric chillers and things called absorption chillers. So we're able to use all of the cooling. So this building has never used any grid cooling or any mechanical, any power off the grid. It runs entirely off a waste stream from a city. So you hear about circular economy and all those things. This is kind of a notion of circular economy, I guess, in this, in this context. Um, here's the boilers. That, that's a model that you can't take a photograph and they're so big. Um, but the, this wood is just being constantly pushed in to a certain depth uh, where it's burned in a high temperature combustion chamber. And then the, uh, all you see of it is in this super tree here, there's, that's a half meter diameter carbon steel chimney that runs up the middle of the super tree and disperses the heat. And then we have a small, uh, um, basically a heat rejection system that just dumps waste heat, surplus heat out through there. And then one of the other super trees has all the desiccant uh, drying system in, in the base. So that's the only sign of the M&E systems on the whole garden, and they are all running in a completely, arguably, is it carbon neutral? I don't know. Is it a good thing to do these things in the, in the Gulf, is it, uh, in, in, in this part of the world? Well, we've taken a waste stream that was getting burned anyway, and we're using it to generate energy. So I guess that's a good thing. We've, we've learned a lot for the, for the local market about using desiccants for drying air. And on the whole, it's been a very successful um, uh, undertaking. We still have big kit. This is, these are the chillers um, that, do the, um, that do the cooling. Um, and we, but what we have actually is we've, got, we've beaten our brief because we actually generate excess more power than we actually need to run the garden. So the waste, the additional energy goes to running all the light shows and things inside the garden. Um, and as you go there, you see these fantastic displays and exhibitions of how it all, how it all works. Um, it's been a life-changing project for us, for me particularly, which we had a, we had a great time doing it. I was working on it with my, some of my best friends and we had a, we had a great time. Um, for the visitor, going around these super tree gardens and walking around the aerial walkways, you, they see the structure, they see the kind of the, the landscape. They don't really see our stuff. So we are the invisible architects in all of this. We're the invisible hand behind it all. Um, but uh, Atelier One did a, a fantastic job on this. I'd, and those of you, if you have been, go to the light show in the evening and it's, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, these are the super trees that have some of the, that's the, the light growth. At uh, night time, it turns into a kind of wonderland. Um, but the best part of it all is this is the client, um, uh, Dr. Tan. And these are the four of us from architecture, yours truly, landscape and structures at the opening day. Um, and we were still friends, which after building a $800 million project, it's quite a good thing, actually. It's a nice feeling. And we still are friends. We're all still friends and we're all together. Of course, it was a much bigger team. That was just a few of us at the, at the opening night dinner. Um, but these things are hard to do. You know, this is where the, what you learn over years is trusting fellow designers. You, learn to, you have to earn people's trust. 
Um, you also need, as the architects have a degree of humility, to want to listen to what you want to say, what, what, what the team have got to say. Because it honestly is the most difficult thing in the world is working with people who don't want to hear what you've got to say and think that they just want to do what they want to do. So not to say that Wilkinson Air aren't willful um, and, and have their architectural agenda. Of course they are. But, and, and we have our agenda and we all have our own agendas. But actually working together collaboratively is what made a project like this really sing. And, and really that's where, where I think the, the, the most valuable lessons one learns are about being able to sit, listen, talk, discuss and all draw together uh, and make a, make a great project. And I'm going to wind it up there on that very positive note. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. I know you are in a hurry. Uh, is there time for any yeah, questions? That's a question. I should explain, it's my wife's birthday today and I've got my whole family around the corner in a restaurant waiting for me because I've got the credit card. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's her 60th, so it's a big, it's a big deal. So, um, uh, well, it is for her anyway, I guess. But I'm happy to take any questions if anyone's got any. There's one over there. First of all, thank you for the inspiring uh, presentation. So I'm a student of uh, sustainable environmental design here at the AA, and uh, mostly we are architects uh, as per our background, mm -hmm. and we constantly wonder if we have to make a decision whether uh, we are going to stay in architecture or become consultants for, uh, or become environmental consultants. And, uh, I just checked your uh, company's website and I see that you're offering many kind of services and I wonder uh, why don't you also do the architecture for these projects? How, how would it be possible to uh, integrate these two um, disciplines even more and even further as in the project that you were presenting uh, these, these professions went hand by hand? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, we, we have thought about it often um, and we've kicked it out as an idea equally as often. Uh, and the main reason for it is that if we start to offer architectural services, we become a competitor to basically the hand that is feeding us, which is the architectural profession, the architectural world. The nature of being a consultant is that you are a trusted collaborator with multiple architects. So the projects I, were going to, I was going to show you next are some work we've been doing with Heatherwick, with Big, um, with the people like that, as well as with Wilkinson Air, with Foster and Partners, with Rogers and Partners. We work with, you know, Zaha's office. We work. The minute we set up as Atelier Architecture the, is the minute the phone stops ringing from my trusted friends who say, I've got a project for you. And I promise you, you know, literally, I mean, every, literally every day, every week, every day of the week, we get a call or a thing about a competition or a project or something like that. And they almost always come from the architectural world um, because most architects, most, architect, most architecture firms believe that working with external collaborators actually gets a better result than having an in-house service. And I, I, I kind of agree with that. I've watched a lot of the big architecture firms struggle with in-house sustainability teams and found it hard to get the traction within the firm. Whereas if you have a project where the, the sustainability team is being is on the outside, we find it, we find we can get more traction. We think, I'm, I'm obviously biased, but. So I worked in a multi-disc firm for a while, but between Bureau Happold and starting Atelier 10, and I, I couldn't get anyone to listen to me. But when I'm on the outside shouting in, it seems to work. If I'm getting, if they're paying me to do something, or the clients pay me to do something, you get their attention. If you're just, if you're the in-house resource, it can be more difficult. So that's why we don't do it. It's a very long answer, but that's the why we why we we decide to stay doing what we do. We get frustrated sometimes. I don't don't deny it, but we we've kept we've kept out of it, and we have many architects on our team. Um, so it's that's that's the answer. A quick, a quick one, if if I may. Sorry for. Go on. 
Um, so the, in, in the coming uh, few decades, a lot of uh, construction is going to happen, but uh, mostly in the developing countries. So the waste majority of buildings and carbon we are going to emit by construction is going to happen in these areas. And how do you think that this kind of services and environmental design and uh, sustainability related information can be made accessible for these areas of the world? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we, 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 one tries, we, we all try our best to get this information out and we, we have very much open source. We don't hide what we do or, or put our arms around it and say it's ours, you can't have it. What, what, you, what I worry most about is um, the, the impact of bad architecture in the emerging markets. Because, you know, if, if you take a, um, you know, you've only got to look at cities like in, in Texas and the States, Phoenix and those places, places like that, where they've just taken sort of the international style and plonked these big glass blocks down and, you know, enormously energy consuming buildings. I, I just hope, I mean, I, I've seen a lot of buildings going up in, in, in India and in Pakistan, less in Pakistan, India, but you do, you do see people being quite concerned for, to, to make buildings that they lose because, because they haven't got the resources. I mean, a lot of the buildings, they have to bring the oil to the building to make it work or whatever. So we, are, we do see to some extent the lessons being learned, but it, it is a, it's, it's down to you know, the big architecture firms who get bought in to, to design these buildings. Um, need to be mindful of some of this stuff because it, you know, there's, there's great possibilities to do better, but there's equally great possibilities to do badly. And our profession hasn't necessarily excelled itself in doing better over the last um, hundred years. But we do have the answers. I think your concern is right. How do we how do we get them out there? I, I, you know, we we do what we can, but it's not it's not it's so that's such a huge problem. I've been teaching sustainable design to a university in America for the last 20 years, which is about the stupidest thing you could imagine. I fly into America every year, every week or every couple of weeks to teach sustainability, which I mean, I do offset my carbon, but obviously, but it is kind of nuts. Um, and yet you think, well, you're throwing a stone, you know, you're constantly doing is throwing a stone in a pond. You're making the ripples expand, the ripples expand, and you hope to have impacts that are beyond you know, your own personal sphere. So the best that you can do is to try and disseminate that knowledge. And I made a, I mean, I don't teach in engineering school, I'm an engineer, but I teach in architecture schools because I think it can have the biggest impact to spread those, that thinking through architecture more than necessarily through engineering. Completely rambling answer, but you get my, hope you get my point. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I think you- I need I to guess, go. Yes. yes, I do. So thank you very much once thank again. Thank you all for, yeah. for your time.